Uh, welcome, Atto. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, Atto, for me, it's an absolute honor to have you in my show because the first time I saw you was in the sports documentary HSI and I watched every episode in the early 2000s on Eurosport. And for everyone who doesn't know, at that time, you were training with John Smith's groups alongside with Maurice Green and other world-class sprinters. You guys were the fastest and it was just amazing to see how you practice. And so please tell me about this time. Um, that... Listen, I think I have to give all the credit to our agent, Emmanuel Hudson, because I tell people all the time, look, I had a reality show before the Kardashians and every now and then I get a chance to look back at it. And it really is fun to look at that sort of snapshot of your life at that time, you know, with your training partners and your friends. And, um, you know, I get a chance to look at UCLA where I train. I get to look at my old house. But I think I don't think we had an idea, as most people say, we didn't know at the time how influential that series was. And because it was on Eurosport, it was going all over Europe and all over Asia and all over the Middle East. To this day, I mean, that was, you know, 22 years ago. And to this day, people will still say, um, 23 years ago, and people will still say, hey, I remember you from the Sprinters series on, on Eurosport. So it's cool to have that now, you know, 20 something years later to be able to look back at. And how was the time in this uh, training group uh, in, this, in those years? Those are some of the best years of my life. You're in the shape of your life. You're in a group where, you know, if you have a bad day, you're in the back. We used to always say that. Um, the group was so talented that, um, excuse me, if you, you know, if, if you were having a bad day, you would know it. So it, it, it really was a case of iron sharpening iron and because we were all so competitive and so talented it's why i mean that you know that group produced olympic champions and world champions and world records and um it was i i couldn't i couldn't picture my career in any other group but i would say it's quite a journey from running for the first time to becoming one of the best sprinters of all time how did you get started into into the sport Do i you was remember actually your first Yeah, I was actually a soccer player. So I was playing soccer, going down the right wing in New York. And the high school coach, at the high school track coach at Jamaica High School sees me. And he says, I, hope, I always remember the interaction. He says, you know, you, you're, you're pretty fast. You're pretty good. Why don't you come try out for my track team? And I looked at him and I was like, hey, I just like scored three goals. Nobody on the field can even like, I was just running circles around everybody. And he goes, yeah, but you scored three, but you guys lost four to three. How would you like to be in a sport where you control the outcome? And that must have, that was literally the magic wand that he had to wave because something just kind of like washed over me. And I was like, Ooh, in control of the eventual outcome. I like, I like that. I like that sentence. And uh, that was it. I, I played high school organized. The last time I played organized soccer was the year after. And then I was completely done and I was a sprinter. So I got discovered playing soccer. And um, my, the guy that discovered me is still alive, Joseph Trupiano. And um, I, try to, uh, I try to mention him as much as possible because I, you know, man, maybe, I'd be, maybe I would have ended up in the Bundesliga. <laughs> But was there a moment when you realized you wanted to become a professional sprinter? Was it in, right in the first year or uh, it took some time? No, it took a little while. I started at 16, which is relatively late, but not unlike Frankie Fredericks and John Regis and some of my other rivals at the time who were also sort of transplants who had been discovered on a football field. It took me, so I started at 16. By 18, I was in the Olympics. So I think it took me another year or so because I, mean, I, was, I was okay when I started. I was doing pretty well. And then I started to beat people um i beat one guy who um had also migrated to new york and he was really good he was like one, a caribbean champion uh, age group champion i thought I remember calling my mother and saying you won't believe who i beat today and she was like who and i told her the name and she was like you beat him and i think even she was like there might be something there so i mean i was because i'm from a small country i was able to make the olympic team two years later But I think, I think it took me about a year and a half, maybe almost two full years before I was like, oh, wait, I, even, I think even when I went to the Olympics the first time, I wasn't sure that pro sprinter was in my future. I just knew I was good enough to represent my country. But, um, but it happened pretty fast once I started. But you started uh, with 16 years. That's pretty, pretty. That's very late. Um, but, you know, my coach always says that sometimes that's a blessing in disguise because you, you know, you have your real age and your training age. I retired at 30. 
So it means that I only ran for 14 years. And it means I was, you know, my professional career was really only about seven or eight seasons. So it means that if you, you know, if you, some, some people I ran against started at five. Yeah. So when they got to 25, they'd only been, they'd already been running 20 years. When I got to 25, you know, I was, you know, I wasn't even 10 years into my career yet. So I think it actually helped me. I, I, I had a relatively injury free career. And I think you could probably trace it back to that. So we talk a little bit about the HSI series where you were featured. And in the next couple of days, the new season of the Netflix print series will be online. And I saw you in one of the videos. So can you tell us a little bit about the new series season? So Sprint on Netflix, um, I believe it's worldwide. Everybody gets it the same yeah. time, November it's 13th, which would, which would make it um, a week from today. So happy seven day countdown before I am almost the, the voice of the damn series now, which is funny <laughs> for me as somebody who was, you know, we, we talked about sprint and, and me having, you know, one of the first series ever about, you know, with track and field. And now here I am. Most of you have seen the trailer. I'm the first voice on that trailer. Yep. Season two is better than season one. And I say that because even though the world championships were fantastic last year in Budapest, the Olympics were better. Um, it was one of the best Olympics that I have attended, athlete or broadcaster. And I think because the stakes are higher and because now you have new players with Tobogo, of course, doing well, and Julian Alfred, of course, doing well, and Gabby Thomas doing well, I think it, it, it feels more encompassing. Now, I don't know if the Jamaicans are going to feel that way because they did not have a particularly good Olympics by their own standards. But I think for everybody else, they're gonna f they're gonna feel like season two is better, and I think season two is better because the stakes are higher. So, on the thirteenth of November, we will find out. But it's it's kind of funny to me that I have become such you know such a prominent voice in that. Um... I would also say it, uh, the twenty four Olympics was uh, one of the maybe the best Olympics of uh, the last I don't know fifty. 80, 100 years. It really was fantastic. Uh, it really was. And, and I get to be a neutral observer. My country yeah. didn't win any medals, Trinidad and Tobago. So it's not <laughs> like I'm saying, oh, we did well, or the country I root for, you know, the country that I root for does well. It really just had uh, a really case of I got to sit. I'm a fan first, but I'm also a broadcaster. So I agree with you. Paris was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one evening I was in the stadium and I was uh, sitting there and it was for me overwhelming as an, just a um, uh, guy who's, who's watching. Yes. I asked, my, asked myself, how is this situation for a uh, woman or a man who's competing for the first time uh, in a stadium like this? I mean, it's how can you stay in focus? And I feel like track and field owed that to the world. And the world owed that to track and field because I sat in the stadium in Tokyo three years ago. Um, and I remember the women's 100 meter final going off. And when Elaine Thompson Hira starts to pull away from the crowd, from the, from the pack to win her second straight 100 meter medal, I heard her footsteps. And I thought to myself, that's never happened to me in any stadium in a pro setting ever. So the crowd roared back. And track and field roared back for the crowd. So it was like track and field had a great performance. And the crowd, is, as you know, you were there. It's one of the best. I was in that stadium in 98, the night of the World Cup final when France won with, with Zizou. I thought on some occasions that it was louder for the Olympics when the French team was doing well. And the French team did not have a good Olympics. But when they were in a race, woo, it was loud. Absolutely. And uh, how do you see the sprint events evolving on the world stage? I mean, uh, there's a lot of things happening in the last couple of years. Well, I think I, I think that the shoe technology obviously have has moved things up. Um, it seems like there's a marathon or a half marathon world record every five days. So I am happy that uh, I am happy that we're having all these records. I, I believe that our record is special. So I actually like the fact that some of those sprint records have gone untouched for a while. The 100 meter record's been there a while. Ditto for the 200 on the men's side. Well, we don't even talk about the women's, which have not been been approached under under 1500. God knows how long. But I still believe that our record is special, and I worry a little bit that the shoe technology and the improvements that they're having because of the shoes are in danger maybe soon of having a lot of the records tumble. 
But the truth is that the sport has to evolve and, and records are not the worst thing in the world. I just don't want a plethora of them all at once. So that, you know, I remember when swimming went through that and was, it, it wasn't, yeah. wasn't as fun. And uh, I hear Usain Bolt talk about uh, the shoes uh, and his records in an uh, interview a couple of weeks ago. And he says it, it isn't fair because if he had shoes like this, he would run uh, some even faster times, way more faster. Yes, um, and I am old enough now to be able to see that argument in both directions. Because I can say, yeah, well, the tracks are faster. And the generation before mine can say, yeah, well, we ran on cinders. And the generation before <laughs> that can say, yeah, well, we dig, we dug our blocks with a, with a damn trowel. So, look, every generation is going to be able to say that. Um, I, don't, I don't doubt that he has a point. I just also think that that's life, buddy. That's the way it's going to be. <laughs> He has set some fantastic records. I actually don't think that 100-meter record, you hear talk about the 100-meter record a lot. I don't think that 100-meter record is going anywhere in the immediacy. Now, Shane Thompson, because of his age and the way he looks, I go, yeah, he probably has a shot. If Noah becomes a better starter, I think Noah has a, uh, Noah Laz has a very good shot too. But I don't see a lot of guys on the scene right now and I go, yeah, I think this is a future 100-meter world record holder. Maybe somebody shows up. I think the 200-meter record for men is yeah. going to go first. And recently you did an interview with Julian Alfred and her coach, uh, yeah. the um, Olympic champion. And from your perspective, what were, were the key points they mentioned as essential to her success at the Olympics uh, in, in this year? Uh, that was my easily my favorite interview of the year because I know the two of them don't give interviews like that. And because of how open they were, I mean, when they were talking about their three-hour conversation with both of them sort of like crying to each other about, you know, and, and, and coach telling athlete, I am not going to let you fail because I look back at my own career and all I have is regret and you're not going to ever feel the pain that I felt. I just, I was here like, whoo, like, because I knew that regardless of how many numbers that interview did, For, you know, for me to go, look, my interview did well. Somewhere out there, there's one or two or three or 300 or 3,000 athletes or coaches that are going to look at that and go, that's something I can take away from that interview. Um, the other highlights from that interview, I thought, were her, their analysis of not feeling like you have to win the 100 from the blocks. Because that's changed that so many, so many coaches have an athlete and think, yeah, I got to get her to, you know, she got to blast everybody out of the blocks. And she was having four start problems because she felt like, oh, my God, I have to have a 10 out of 10 start. That was also important. And I thought the other thing was their comments about talent versus work ethic and him talking about, oh, I've had way more talented athletes than Julian Alfred. But this is my first 100-meter Olympic uh, women's champion. Why? Because she's not afraid of the work. And there's, there's something about her upbringing and growing up poor and growing up feeling like, you know, maybe she wasn't handed the best set of cards that you could be handed and feeling like, yeah, but I can do something about it. I thought that was, those were the three things that I take away from the interview as like, I rewatch the interview sometimes just to hear them uh, talk mm -hmm. about those parts. I will also put the episode in the show notes of our uh, episode because I love the interview as well. It was, Thank you. Uh, just amazing. Thank you. So um, another thing about 2024 Olympics uh, where was Snoop Dogg. Uh, I would say Snoop was uh, kind of the face of the Olympics. And, um, but he also was at the US trials where you and Wallace Spearman were running 200 meters against him. And I guess I think he finished in... 33 or 34 seconds so he wasn't quite he wasn't quite fast for a, a musician i would say and, um, so tell me about your experience with snoop um i am a, i am a big hip-hop fan i was born the same year as hip-hop 73 i moved from trinidad to queens new york um actually was in was around was hanging out at the same time as uh, as 50 cent he went to my rival high school he and i are about a year apart in age wow. so i i you know it wasn't uncommon to see ll cool j around around town so i always felt like i have had this connection to hip-hop even though i'm i'm born in the land of soca um i meeting snoop i was like you know sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes 
You don't want to meet people you're a big fan of. And I, I'm not a, I don't get starstruck. I, I've been around actors and actresses and, and, and people who are celebrities my whole life. But when Snoop shows up at the U.S. trials, I was like, wow, this is like, this is so cool. And then to actually spend time with him and realize, oh, he's, he's even cooler than you thought in your head. Um, I am so happy. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when he was on trial for murder. So I am, it, it's a great lesson to men, to black men, to, to, to all men of color. That, you know, how your life starts is not how it has to end. I don't think anybody has had a bigger 2024 in America than Snoop. He was at the U.S. Olympic trials. He was at the Olympics. And he was just, he signed everybody's autograph, took everybody's picture. He really just, he added to it. Because I know there were some people who were like, oh, uh, here's NBC. Here's America trying to like, try to force the Olympics to be cool by putting celebrities in it. And it wasn't that at all. He didn't come on any celebrity type thing. He came on a, wow, I'm such a fan of this. I'm such a fan of that. And to answer your question about the race, I tried to convince him. I was like, look, just 100. You don't want to do that 200. It's long. I run every day. I'm still lifting like I'm a damn Olympic athlete. I don't want, I don't think you want to run against us. Wallace Spearman was a, was a world medalist. I was a world champion. Like, just run the 100. He's like, nope. I'm five deuce. I'm 52. We're running the deuce. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so one thing is for sure. It's a piece of footage that is never going to die. 50 years from now, somebody's going to trot that out and go, look at Snoop Dogg running 34 seconds. The time that he ran does, doesn't even matter to me because as I told him, it's like, you're still faster than everybody else sitting on the couch. That's true. But was he nervous before the race? Absolutely not. This man has performed in front. This, guy, this man has done a Super Bowl. He thinks he's going to be nervous to run? No, no, no. There were, he, he had, I was more nervous than him. I was nervous about, I was on the outside lane. So I was nervous about, I, I didn't know how fast to run. Because I'm like, are they really going to run? Or is this like, I knew I had to stay in the frame because there were like 8 million cameras on us. But no, he was nervous, no. Because uh, one time I uh, did a video uh, between a uh, um, uh, Bundesliga Football player Mats Hummels, he was a world champion and a German 400 meter sprinter, Alisa Schmidt. And uh, they ran the 400 meters against each other. And to see uh, a football player who uh, was also world champion so nervous before a race was just amazing. Yeah, you don't, know, you have to be, when celebrities are around, you know, you know it's going to go viral. That's the thing. About, I was yeah. like, look, this has to, I wanted to look a certain way. I made like, I made Nike give me clothes and stuff, like new clothes to run. And I'm like, hey, I can't run in like my training stuff. I'm going to look like a bum. Because I knew NBC, I knew NBC, my station was going to air it. I knew it would go viral. I knew Snoop would post it to his 50, 60 million followers. So it was, it really was a case of, you know, this has to, has to the running of it is the least of it. It has to look right. But I, I was really happy with how it came out because um, Snoop genuinely was like, okay, you know, Maybe that was a little further than I wanted to run. I was like, I told you, 200 is, that's half a lap. It looks, doesn't look far, but it's far. Yeah, true. But now I would, uh, would like to look uh, to the uh, next season. So the gap mm. between the five fastest guys these days is very, very small. So who do you think will be the most dominant sprinter in the next year? Maybe uh, by the men and also by the, by the women's. Julian Alfred is not going anywhere. If I had to bet on somebody to dominate until the next Olympics, I would say Julian. She is as fast as anybody else at 200, except really for Elaine Thompson Hira, and we'll see how she comes back from her injuries, and Sharika Jackson, who is now 30 and is getting up there in age. Shakari has to do a lot. Shakari Richardson has to do a lot of work on her start. I feel like. The reason why Julian Alfred was just able to run away with the Olympic gold is because Shakari's start just, it just did not, it didn't, it wasn't up to the standard it needed to be at the moment she needed it. She had some struggles at the U.S. Olympic trials, and then at, at the games, her start just disappeared. Um, so I would pick Julian to dominate uh, in terms of the 100 for the next four years. You know, she might lose a race here and there, and maybe she loses one of the world championships in between, but I just feel like that combination of combination of coach and athlete and what she's had to overcome to get here i'm not bet i'm not betting against her unless i see somebody show up with something else that uh that's surprising on the men's side i'm not picking against noah because for all the the, the drama and the hype and 
and and, and you're gonna see all the all the behind the scenes of of how chaotic Noah's Olympics were um, in in the Netflix show. Noah has the Olympic hundred meter gold. For three years ago, he could not even make the U.S. hundred meter team, and now he has the most coveted medal in the whole Olympics. So that didn't go away. He just started his practice, uh, his his off season for 2025 next year. Noah will take some losses, but when the when the heat is on, I can't I, I can't bet against Noah. His biggest problem is Kashane Thompson of uh, of Jamaica. So if let's see Tebogo, what do you think about him? Not in the hundred, not in the hundred. Let's see, Le still he still has a kind of quarter miler form. That's I I I cannot. I am a huge Tobogo fan. Now, if you ask me what Noah's problems are at two hundred. Obviously, he has a problem with Tobogo, who is younger and is not afraid of not afraid of him. I don't think he likes Noah that much, to be honest. In the 200, it's Noah and Tobogo. Make no mistake about it. But in the 100, I think it's more Noah and Kishane because I feel like uh, Tobogo has to improve his start. He has to improve his form before he is going to be... Uh, I'm, and I know he got the silver last year and, and damn near almost won Worlds. I just feel like I have to see some changes in him before I'm ready to to crown him as the next king. Once I did an interview with a, a coach who practiced in uh, Botswana, uh, the country of uh, Tobogo, and he said there's a, a city like in the middle of nowhere where all the groups of Botswana come together and train for the 442. Uh, it must be an amazing place because the, the city isn't that that big and it's like in the middle of the desert but a lot of very talented and well-trained athletes come from there so uh, for me it's quite amazing as long as you have a system it doesn't matter what country you're in what location and you could be on the moon you put talent with the right coaching and then support it so that you know the athlete doesn't have to worry about you know working three jobs and how am i gonna eat and all that stuff and that's the beauty of our sport we have A 200 meter uh, first time champion in Tobogo, who's from the middle of Africa. And then you have this young woman in Julian Alfred, who is from this tiny little place in the, in the South Caribbean called St. Lucia. And, and both of them mean the world to their country. So it's not just about the, the Germanys and the USAs and the, and the Canadas and the, and the, and the United Kingdoms. I love the sport that I love the fact that our sport has room for everybody, yeah, right? Room for absolutely. everybody. Doesn't matter your size, your shape, your color. If you are good enough, what does the clock say? What does the what does the tape measure say? So that's all that matters. What would you say is the right uh, system? Um, the other part of that system, it's not a it's not a it's not an absolute must, but it helps. One, you have the 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 you have to scout. So scout for talent, identify talent. Put the talent with put the talent with the the, the coaches that are capable of, you know, re, of grooming them properly and getting them, you know, to, to the next level. And then you got to have camps. It's not a it's not a coincidence that get you know so many of the Olympic champions that you can point to. I mean, yeah, Julian Alfred will tell you I trained with Dina Asher Smith and you know Rashida Adeleke. That that counts for something. That that's what pushes her. I know, you know, I know how much my group meant to me. Anybody that you can anybody that you can point to usually has a, a training group or a training partner that they will tell you, hey, I don't know, I don't know if I would be on the top of the podium without that without that person, you know, pushing me or, or pulling me every day. So I come to the five questions I ask every of my guests. And the first one is What has been your favorite competition, regardless uh, of the placement? So just uh, like uh, uh, emotional. Favorite competition, Commonwealth Games 98. Um, I don't know how that is still the record 26 years later. Um, it was, it was a, a race. I wasn't sure if I was going to go. It was at the end of the year. Um, there wasn't a championship that year. And I decided to go. And it just ended up, it, it's, it's probably my best 100 meter race from zero to 100. It wasn't my best time. It was 988 because it was on a pretty slow track with, into a headwind or with no wind. But um, in terms of competition, that, that's number one. Probably number two, I did a sub 10, sub 20 double in Lausanne, I think in 90, in 2000. I think it was 2000, yeah. 
and that that was one of my it just I just one of those days where you know it's like a, a basketball player talking about in the zone where the, the the basketball just feels you know the the rim just the the rim just looks huge. That's what it felt like for me. I just felt like I could run if I had to run a, a forty four second relay leg that day. I could. I just felt just full of energy. Maybe third, and it's funny that you know that your timing would be my race in Stuttgart at 200 meters. Now, I never saw that race. I ran it. The the the, the way that Stuttgart, and, and, and RIP to that meet, because it was such a great meet, they could never pay me my fee. So I am a huge Porsche fan. There's a Porsche in my, in my driveway right now. And they could never pay my fee. So what they would do is they would have me come out to Stuttgart and I would, I would drive a Porsche for a week and then run. So that that me was not diamond was wasn't diamond league or golden league back then. So I never saw the race. It's my personal best forever right. and ever. I'm not I'm not running faster than 1977 ever again. And I had never seen the race up until this week. Um, it was me and six, Frankie Fredericks in five, and Maurice in four. The joke about the race is I wanted six and I would not waver. I wanted to be on the outside. Maurice didn't care. Maurice wanted five, and Frankie Fredericks' agent was fighting for five like no frankie wants five frankie wants five and all the other agents were like do you really want to put your client in between maurice and otto and um no they fought for it and they were like okay maurice i don't think maurice green ever beat frankie fredericks in a, in a 200 meters remember this is the frankie fredericks that had just run 1968 the year before to get silver he was the second fastest man of all time and frankie was in that race and he got third that day and i know he had to be thinking wow. mm, maybe i should have gone in four and put maurice in five but um, it's, that that would be my third one because it was another one of those days where I just felt like I could run all day. I couldn't believe when I looked at the clock and it said 1977. I thought maybe I'd run 198 at best, and it's my only sub 198. So that's that's my third favorite uh, competition. And uh, days before you stayed in Stuttgart, and they gave you a Porsche to drive on the autobahn. Right. Give me a Porsche to drive on the Autobahn. And here's here's the problem. I had been living in the States. I didn't know that much about Germany. I hadn't spent that much time in Germany at that point. This is literally the my first year being a pro. So I had always I'm a car guy. I love cars. But you know, one of the mis one of the, the, the misconceptions about the Autobahn for people who do not live there is that the whole thing is just Speed, you know, speed as much as you want, no speed limit. As you know, that is not true. So when the meat paid me, the money was a little light. And we were like, hey, why is the money like? He's like, well, he has a lot of tickets from, <laughs> he has a lot of speeding tickets because apparently he went very crazy on the Autobahn in, in some of the, the areas that had a speed limit. So that that was funny. So I, 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 t I am always the person now that tells people who think, Americans who think they're going to go to the Autobahn and go crazy. Make sure that you're in a zone where you can actually drive um, as fast as you want, because the whole thing is not yeah. like that. In fact, most of it is not. So I learned that lesson at 23. So and on the other side, uh, what was the toughest competition you ever faced? Toughest competition, that's easy. Sydney 2000. Um, that Olympics, I felt like I was running with an anchor attached to me. I had gotten injured the year before, a pretty serious hamstring injury. It's the only injury I really had in my career. Missed the world championships in Seville, did not have a good off season, did not have a good 2000 season. And yet here I was in Sydney running against a very dominant Maurice Green. It was cold. I never liked to run cold by my tropical Trinidad standards. It was probably, I think I have the, the, the thing of the, of the race. I think maybe it was 69 Fahrenheit. So it wasn't particularly cold, but it was cold for me. And I had to kind of, you know, suck it up buttercup. And I'm very proud of that, that silver from way out in lane eight. And then in the 200, my body was like, we have nothing left. And it wasn't physically, it was emotionally, I had nothing left. And had to take on Kenteris from Greece and wasn't, I, I just hung on for third, but I'm probably more proud of that, um, of that particular medal than any other, because I was very close to just like, just pulling out of the meat. And my mother was like, so for the rest of your life, you're going to tell the story about how you were at the Olympics and... Because you didn't feel 100%, you pulled out. And I was like, you know, your mother can kind of tell you something without telling you. And I was like, you know, get your ass on the truck. And then, I, you know, I had to, I had, I had a 100-meter fight the last 100 with Obadeli Thompson, who had, a, who had won a medal in the 100, a bronze, and wanted to leave with two medals. And I literally threw myself at the line to make sure that I held off Obadeli. So 
I of all my Olympic races, I probably remember that one the most from zero to 200 because it was like I could not shake him. Uh, I think I ended up running 2020 for bronze and he ran 2021. So it was I, like, I earned that medal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was I mean, we leaned at the tape. It was it was that close. So um, uh, what was your you talk about your injury, but uh, when you uh, um, uh, back in, in, in training practice, what was your favorite type of training? Uh, I think that I think my favorite workout was 150s. I think that was probably the best combination of my ability to run a really good turn and my and my ability to run a really good hundred. So I, I always remember that that was like Maurice Green's least favorite workout. It's something about what that does to your VO2 max, where he would always be over there like losing 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 his lunch, and um, and I'd be like. I'm fine. And, 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 and that was, that, that's just, that's just how it was most of the time. And how many, uh, reps do you do? It's just one 150 or uh, two or, no, or five? No, that workout was 150 times five. And of course, everybody's good for like the, everybody's good for like the first, you know, three or four. It's when, or first two or three, it's when you get to that fourth or fifth one where it's like, oh my gosh, you know? So, yeah. But what's the rest between the, uh, The rest is walk back. So walk you start back. at okay, 150, wow. right? And then, and, and you know, and our group, we probably started 16 seconds. And then by the time wow. you really got into it, you were at 15 low. And then on the last one, you know, and that's the thing. We were so competitive and we didn't run together. That was one where you went solo. So, you know, you'd hear the other person's time and be like, oh, okay. So he ran 15 too. All right, watch this. I want to run 15 one. So They were very high quality and the, the rest was very minimal. And on the other side, what was the training uh, you disliked the most? I wasn't a big fan of 300s. <laughs> and 300s are kind of a staple for John Smith. We had a Monday workout that was like 300 times five. I did not love those. But even now, as somebody who, you know, I'm just... I, I always tell people, I'm not running to stay in, I'm not running to stay in shape. I run still because videotape is forever. And I've been on, I've been on camera for 20 years and I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be the one who's, you know, calling the races of the, of the fastest people on, on the planet. And I'm, you know, 50 pounds overweight. So I ran at 175 and when I'm on television, I'm usually around 190, 195. So I feel like that is, that is me being my, my, my fittest self with the ability to still, you know, drink a beer or eat some garbage when I, when I occasionally feel like it. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't like 300s, but I still run 300s now because I know how much they hurt and because I know how good they are for me. It's like, yeah, I don't want, I can go out there and run a hundred now. And it's like, yeah, I mean, when I run hundreds on, on my track now, people go, Hey, you're making a comeback. It's like, no, I'm not making a comeback. I run 300 still because it's it, it's the thing. It's almost like it's like Bruce Wayne going in, in the cave with all the bats, right? It's the thing that he was most afraid of, and it's the thing he embraced. It's it's almost the same way for me. So my last question is always: uh, What advice would you give to young athletes or to your younger self? I think it's the, I think it's the same answer. Enjoy the journey more. Maybe it's because of my personality. Maybe it's because of my discipline. Maybe it's because I'm just you know. In or retentive. My, I have fond memories of my career because I had success, but I don't know if stopping and smelling the roses, so to speak, was something I did well. Because if I won, my attitude was, okay, right, you won. We have to, we have to win the next time. And if I lost, it was, okay, you lost. Why did you lose? We have to win the next time. And I think the accumulation of that year after year after year after year It's almost like you got in the door, you went out the other door, and you didn't take time to really appreciate. I mean, I got to be in fantastic cities and get wine and dined and eat with princes and princesses and in palaces. And a lot of the times it was like I couldn't enjoy the moment because I was too busy worried about the next competition or the next whatever. And if I could talk to my 20 year old self just you know running his first races as a pro i would say hey 
You're going to have the medals you're going to have at the end anyway. How about you enjoy it a little more? Don't be stuck up in the hotel room all the time. You can take off the blinders sometimes and, and, and enjoy your enjoy your young life. Because trust me, you're going to be 50 years old looking back like, wow, you know, I should have, could have enjoyed that a little more. Wow. That's some, some wise words. Uh, Atul, thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much. It's been really good to talk to you.